Hi, my name is Joseph Chinara. I'm the editor of International Socialism Journal. And I want to talk to you today about a new phase in the coronavirus crisis in Britain. And I want to focus on the economic dimension of that, because we're now entering a very dangerous period in which I think we're likely to see a very, very sharp escalation of job losses. You may have heard Rishi Sunak's statement today, Wednesday, where he talked about the measures that have been taken by the government. And the first thing I want to say is that the measures that are being proposed are actually extraordinarily modest compared to what's already been done in the face of this crisis. So the really big steps taken by the government came earlier in the year, where you get in May alone, something like a 50 billion pound increase in government uh, borrowing. This is used to help finance huge packages of loan guarantees and direct bailouts aimed at uh, companies, at businesses to support them, combined with this really, really big uh, furlough scheme and measures of uh, support for the self-employed. Of course, these schemes didn't go far enough for, for many people, including those of us on the left, but they're a really significant intervention in the economy by the state, the kind of thing we haven't really seen in peacetime for a very, very long time in Britain. When you compare it to those measures, the uh, announcement by Sunak uh, today is extraordinarily modest. If you look at the arts funding, the scheme to get young people into work, or the three billion announced for uh, green jobs, these are very, very small scale. Even the uh, cut to VAT, which will cost about £4.5 billion, uh, pounds, is relatively limited compared to these earlier measures. And I think that's very, very important to understand, because what Sunak confirmed today is that we're going to see the tapering out of the furlough scheme, which will begin to wind up in August and will end completely in October. Now, the reason that's so important is that the furlough scheme in particular has insulated Britain to an extent from the kind of job losses that have been seen in the USA and elsewhere. And it's meant that for us, the focus has primarily been on the impact of the virus itself. Now that's likely to change, and we're likely to see very, very large job losses across the private sector. And part of the reason the job losses are going to be so bad is if you look at the scale of the crisis. These are the projections from the Office for Budgetary Responsibility in Britain. And what you see is projections for a crisis two or three times as big as the recession of 2008-2009, the last big crisis in Britain. Now, faced with this, uh, we're already seeing, in, in anticipation of the tapering, of the furlough scheme, announcements of quite big job losses across the private sector. 5,000 jobs going at the owners of Upper Crust, 700 at Harrods, 1,700 at Airbus, adding to, I think, 9,000 at Royals Royce, 10,000 at BP, 12,000 at British Airways, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, one of the things that's happening is the possibility of a rise in unemployment way above the sort of 10% uh, threshold in official figures. We haven't seen unemployment on that scale since the early 1990s, and it may even go back to the kind of levels that we saw in the early 1980s. Now, that's an important comparison because what you get in the early 1980s in particular is a wide-scale restructuring of the British economy decimating whole areas of manufacturing. And after that, you get the, the emergence of a British model based largely on the service sector, on finance, with quite high levels as well of public sector employment, in which it's quite hard to restructure the economy, quite hard to shut down an entire hospital or a school. Um, and generally in the service sector, you don't uh, see the kind of sharp increase in unemployment that historically you see in the manufacturing sector, certainly not in, in, in Britain. And what you're seeing now is a possibility of a much more broad restructuring of these sectors than we've seen 
in recent years and decades. So the, the sectors that are really under threat are, first of all, sectors that were doing quite badly before the crisis erupted. This includes large swathes of the high street, of the retail sector, where you've seen lots of uh, job losses already announced. Uh, it uh, affects bits of uh, what Britain has retained in the way of manufacturing, uh, where you're often seeing uh, firms announcing, again, uh, redundancies already. It will impact on broadcasting and media corporations, which were under pressure before the crisis uh, erupted. It also impacts on firms with very, very high fixed costs who are seeing uh, declines in revenue. So uh, the airlines are a really obvious example of that. But we can include in that the university sector, where we're seeing potentially a very sharp contraction in, in particular overseas students who bring with them very large fees. And already in the universities, you've seen uh, temporary employees who formed quite a large section of the teaching workforce in this sector being told that they won't have jobs to come back to. And we're likely to see more of that in the months ahead. Now, this problem is reinforced by another trend that we've seen in the British economy. What you've seen in recent crises going back to the early 1980s is a succession of crises driven above all else by the low level of levels of profitability that developed in the late 1970s and early 1980s in Britain. These low levels of profitability have been covered up by high levels of, of debt, and in particular corporate debt. And every time the economy has gone into crisis, what you've seen is cuts in interest rates and other measures such as quantitative easing that have essentially uh, led to a financialized bailout for the corporate sector, which has uh, shouldered higher and higher levels of corporate debt. So you see in this graph, the long-term increase in corporate debt uh, up until 2008, 2009, it goes down a little bit, but it's relatively high even today. And this is across the whole non-financial corporate sector. It's much more concentrated uh, in what we call the zombie companies. These are largely unprofitable firms that don't really engage in high levels of investment, but have been able to lumber on, as zombies do, uh, by swallowing up more and more debt. And it's these kind of firms that are likely to be the first to go under as the crisis unfolds. And of course, this will be reinforced by the impact of COVID-19 itself. Already, we're, we're hearing that 60% of people are scared to travel on public transport in Britain, are scared to go to the cinema, are scared to eat in restaurants or go to bars. Understandably so in the current context, but imagine how much worse it's going to get if we have a second wave of coronavirus uh, cases as the government force open the British economy. And I would say that second wave is looking in incredibly uh, likely in the period ahead. Now, alongside what's happening in the private sector, we have the question of what will happen in the public sector. Here, I'm not sure you're going to see the same level of immediate job losses. Lots of uh, commentators, including quite left-wing commentators, have pointed out that the instincts of Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak at the moment are not to impose sweeping austerity. That's partly because they're burned by the experience of 2010. They're worried that a shift to austerity will choke off any recovery in Britain. And they're worried about the impact on public opinion. Um, in the last election, the uh, story goes that, that Boris Johnson won over large numbers of voters in former Labour voting areas in the Midlands, the north of England and so on. These people expect quite high levels of public sector spending. Moreover, if you look at the civil service and so on, the upper echelons of the civil service uh, and the Treasury and elsewhere, they accept relatively high levels of debt to uh, GDP are going to occur in, in the years ahead. Now, all that is true, but we have to understand uh, 
that states are operating in a context of highly integrated uh, bond markets on which states borrow. And what you may see in the months and years ahead are the kind of processes we saw in 2010, which were seen particularly in the southern European states, where there's a kind of competitive uh, pressure on states to contain their public sector spending, to impose austerity in the face of bond markets turning against the ones whose debts were seen as the most risky. Moreover, uh, if you look at the public sector debt projections, they're premised on a, a very sharp recovery taking place in Britain. Now, if we have large levels of firm failures in Britain, which I, I would say is quite likely, it is likely that the bounce back of the economy is not on the scale seen in the most rosy projections of the Office for Budgetary Responsibility. And under those circumstances, uh, public sector borrowing can face much, much tighter constraints and there'll be much more pressure on the government to impose public sector uh, cuts. And we've already seen in the paper that was leaked to the Daily Telegraph uh, a few weeks ago, Rishi Sunak is weighing up different options, one of which is a public sector pay freeze and other cuts inside the public sector. So as I say, in looking at the, at the period ahead, what we should anticipate is really a really sharp jobs massacre in the private sector and the possibility in the longer term of attacks inside the public sector. What do we do faced by that? I think the first and most basic uh, thing to say is we need to see resistance and we need to see fighting trade unions growing and developing a struggle across both the private and public sector. That means resistance where jobs are threatened, but it also means solidarity uh, with those groups of workers who risk uh, job losses in the months and years ahead. Now, we may see uh, sharp localised struggles like we saw to a limited extent in, in the wake of the previous recession, where in companies like Visteon, which was a supplier for Ford Motor Company, and Vestas, uh, which was a producer of wind turbines, when these uh, companies were threatened with, with closure, you saw occupations of these firms by workers. You may see localised struggles like that taking place, which would be very uh, significant. Uh, more generally, though, I think we have to say we need a more radical fight back from the union leaders. Too many of the union leaders seem to be looking to partnership with the government where they accept all kinds of crap um, from employers on the basis that this is a desperate struggle to hold on to jobs. The best way to hold on to jobs, I think, is to fight and to make demands of government. And these should be radical demands. We should insist that rather than just bailing out the corporate sector, the government steps in and nationalises failing firms and job cutting firms without compensation to protect jobs. Where jobs uh, can't be held on to, workers should be subsidised, retrained and directed to those bits of the economy that we need in the period ahead. For example, we need a much more significant programme of green jobs. Not the three billion that's uh, been an announced, but tens or even hundreds of billions to fund the transition to a much more green economy. Even Germany has announced not three billion pounds, but 36 billion pounds for its green um, programme. In other words, we, we should uh, argue for a much more ambitious series, series of programmes and a series of programmes not um, designed to protect the profits of the corporations, but designed above all else to protect working class livelihoods. And it's these kind of measures that we should demand the trade unions at a national level uh, begin to uh, present to government and demand from government and back up those demands with real struggle inside uh, the working class. So that, I think, is a challenge for the period ahead. We need a much more radical series of demands and a much more radical programme of action and fighting unions. Thank you for listening. If you want to find out more,
Uh, we have a series of publications, including the International Socialism Journal. The next issue will be out in a, in, in a week or two's time. And we have a series of articles developing these arguments and talking about what, we should, what should be done in response to the crises uh, engendered by the COVID-19 pandemic. So please read our publications, listen to our broadcasts uh, and get involved in your locality. Thank you very much.